going to be a splice together of a couple of different lectures that I've already done for these courses. Um, I've got a lecture going over mutations that I spliced together for my microbiology course. I've got a lecture over viruses as well. Um, so I'll be splicing those together in the video. Um, I'm also going to be relying a little bit on the supplemental uh, videos so you guys can get a good taste of how transcription and translation really works um, in movement and how things move around. Um, so I'll be splicing together a couple of videos in this one, so we'll uh, jump from PowerPoint to PowerPoint, but the information will be the same. Um, so follow along, I'll keep them in the same order as the PowerPoint that you're using here, um, but they will be slightly different on the PowerPoint, but the information will be the same. It'll be a little more information, um, but so you guys just will uh, rely on what you see here. Um, the extra information that I provide on the PowerPoint, in this extra video is just for supplemental information. So if you have any questions about this one, please feel free to email me, um, and I'll answer them for you. Okay, guys, so this lecture is going to talk about DNA, um, how it's put together, kind of how it works, um, and then kind of how it works to uh, uh, make genes and kind of what a gene is and how genes work and things like that, and then a little bit about how uh, um, genes are modified in nature and things like that. So let's go ahead and start off with talking about what DNA is. Um, so DNA is essentially the key to life. Um, this is the recipe for living organisms. Um, it's put together uh, things called nucleotides, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, and these nucleotides are put together in a, a specific way um, that can read as a code. Um, and our cells can interpret this code to produce specific proteins, which then can be used to assemble your heart, um, your muscles, your eyeballs, and things like that. Um, and then can be also used to uh, assemble proteins that uh, allow your body to do work, like a form of enzymes and things like that. Um, so DNA is very, very, very important. Without DNA, um, you would not be able to make those proteins um, that you need to make your own body um, or to do work inside of your own cells. Um, so DNA is the shape of a double helix. You can see it here. This is one helix here, and the other helix is there. So this is one side of it, and the other side's there. And it was discovered by this lady named Rosalind Franklin. This is a picture of so, uh, something called X-ray crystallography. And the two other guys right here, um, Alfred Crick and James Watson. I think it's these two guys. We're not going to swear to it. These two guys, I think. Um, they're British. Uh, one of them's American. I think Watson's American. She's British. Um, Crick is British. Um, these three people discovered um, the structure of DNA. Very, very complicated story. Um, you can check that out on YouTube if you want to. They kind of stole her research a little bit, but she died of cancer before they were able to publish it. Um, so she's kind of undercredited for this one. Um, very complicated story. Um, these two guys are also not very nice guys, by the way. Um, so um, lots and lots and lots of people talk about this one. Um, so check out the discovery of DNA. Dig a little deeper on that one on YouTube if you want to. Very interesting little uh, story on that. So um, as I mentioned, um, DNA is put together of things called nucleotides. There are four different types of nucleotides. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. They all look like this. Um, they're all put together the same. You have a phosphate group. A sugar, deoxyribose, in the case of DNA, uh, ribose, in the case of RNA, hence the name difference. So phosphate group, ribose, deoxyribose, sugar, and then one of these four nitrogenous bases down here. So this is a nitrogenous base right here, this shape, and then it's going to be one of these four, adenine, guanine, thymine, or cytosine. So one of those four. You have one side that runs one direction. You can see the P's go this direction up, and the other side of the DNA, the double helix part, the other side of it goes down the other direction. Um, so what you have is you have a nucleotide over here, and that could be an A, and on the other side you're going to have a T. They bond in a specific order. A bonds to T, and then G bonds to C. So if you have a C on one side, you'll have a G on the other, a G on the other, you'll have a C on the other, and an A to a T, T to an A kind of thing. And this is what holds DNA together, this bonding of the nucleotides together. And this specific order that these A's, T's, G's, and C's are put together in, and is what's going to be used by your body to read the recipe to make um, specific proteins and things. So this is the code. These A's, T's, G's, and C's, the way that they're assembled, is what's going to be used to make proteins, to uh, make your body, and things like that. So um, they're held together by hydrogen bonds in the middle. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. They're going to hold the two different strands of DNA together. So one strand over here, one strand over here, and then they're held together in the middle by hydrogen bonds um, between the two different um, nitrogenous base pairs. So A over here, here, G over here, and they're bonded by hydrogen bonds in the middle. So what is a gene? Well, a gene is a specific little piece of DNA 
um, it's kind of like a word, if you like, or maybe a sentence, um, that codes for a specific protein to be produced. Now, proteins are produced in two different steps, uh, stages, if you like, um, called transcription and translation. Transcription um, is taking one language and writing it um, in the same language in a different way. So you guys would transcribe uh, my words that I'm saying into your notes. They're both in English. Um, but it's going to be my words, and you're going to write your words that are slightly different than mine, but say pretty much the same kind of thing. So same language, um, but it's going to say essentially the same thing, but the keyword there is in there in the same language. So in this case, transcription is going to take DNA, which is a nucleotide-based language, and change it into RNA, which is also a nucleotide-based language. So it's slightly different on both nucleotides, but a different uh, form of the same kind of thing. And then translation is going to occur when that RNA is going to be used. Um, it's going to leave the nucleus, going into the cytoplasm, finding a ribosome, and then going to be uh, translated from a nucleotide-based language to a protein-based language, an amino acid-based language, so a totally different type of language. So transcription and then translation. So going from DNA to RNA is transcription, and RNA to proteins is translation. So different types of languages, so English to English from transcription, and then English to uh, French or something for translation. So that's the kind of the steps here. So um, I'm going to kind of rely a little bit on the videos, um, the supplementary based videos for you guys on this one. So you can kind of see this stuff work um, in real time, watch a transcription uh, uh, trait place inside of the DNA and the RNA to watch how these um, things bond. Um, to watch how DNA breaks apart, to watch the RNA polymerase come in and start adding um, different types of uh, things. So if you want to see that, check those out. Um, so there are three different types of RNA. We have messenger type RNA, ribosomal type RNA, and tRNA. Now there are a couple of other types of RNA, but these are the three big ones that are interacting in, in a, a transcription and translation. So mRNA, messenger RNA, is going to be um, used to carry the message. Um, of DNA, what DNA needs to say, what DNA is going to make the proteins for, what the recipe is going to say. I mean, it's going to carry that, that me uh, message from the DNA in the form of mRNA, messenger RNA, out to the ribosome. Um, and then that ribosome is going to read the mRNA, the messenger RNA, um, and then make our protein. Ribosomal RNA, rRNA, is going to be making up the ribosome. Um, it's going to be made out of rRNA. And then transfer RNA, tRNA, is going to hold the um, amino acids that are going to come into the ribosome and deposit their amino acids on the growing protein chain. So like I said, check out the supplemental videos on this one, and you'll be able to see this happen in real time. It'll be a little more, uh, a little more visual. So transcription is going to occur in the nucleus, um, DNA to RNA. So essentially what's going to happen um, is you're going to replace the uh, thymines with uracil. So there is no T, no thymine in RNA. Um, so T um, is going to be replaced with the um, nucleotide U, uracil. So any A's that are in DNA are going to be bound with uracils, and any thymine that happen to be in the DNA are going to end up being bound with adenine in RNA. So they just replace them. So the A's get replaced with a U, and any T's get replaced with an A kind of thing. So there are no T's in RNA. There's no thymine in RNA, and that's kind of one of the big differences between them. Um, we're also going to take this from a double-stranded RNA to a single-stranded mRNA um, strain as well. So it's kind of the big processes here. Um, so this occurs in three different steps. Um, you have initiation, elongation, and termination. So initiation is going to occur when the RNA polymerase enzyme is going to bond to the DNA strand. And it's going to break apart the double-stranded DNA strand here, and it's going to start um, reading the DNA strand and converting it from DNA into RNA. Um, so that's kind of the big deal here. So what's going to happen is what you can see here, um, one strand of the DNA, you don't need the other one, you need a, one strand, it's called the complementary or the uh, anti complementary or things like that. They have different names depending on the different books that you're using and things like that or the scientists that you're talking to. Um, but essentially what's going to happen is the DNA um, is going to be split in half. The RNA polymerase enzyme is going to make a copy of one side. While it's making a copy, um, it's going to replace, see it should be bonding a T here, um, but there are no T's in um, RNA, so it's going to bond a U. If it had a T over here, it would bond an A kind of thing. So that's the switch um, between our DNA and our RNA. 
So RNA polymerase is going to come in and make this RNA messenger chain. Um, essentially what's going to happen um, is the elongation stage is going to occur um, as this grows and continues. It's going to continue to grow as the RNA polymerase strain moves down the DNA until eventually it reaches the termination point um, where there is the end of that particular protein, that gene is done, um, there is no more gene to turn into mRNA, um, and the protein will stop, the MR, uh, RNA polymerase will stop transcribing um, DNA into RNA there. It will stop, it will be released, it will go back off and do its thing in the cell, um, and then you'll be left with a um, DNA strand that will recoil itself and rebond back together, and then a little piece of RNA as well. Okay, so one of two things is also going to happen as well. Um, inside of our cells here, our um, DNA, um, you're going to have a bunch of useless proteins, a bunch of, sorry, useless DNA things. Those are called exons. Um, they don't transcribe genes, um, so those are going to be removed. Um, and the things that are actually important genes and things are called introns. You can see those here. So the exons are gotten removed. Uh, removed. Um, the introns are, sorry, those are going to be removed later. So let me go ahead and talk about what those are so you kind of know what those are now. Um, so we're going to take the DNA and transcribe it into RNA. We're going to add a cap on one end here and a tail on the other end here. And this is what this is for. Let me go ahead and talk about that in just a second. mRNA cap goes on one side of the RNA, mRNA uh, strand. If this RNA leaves the nucleus and enters out into the cell cytoplasm as it was, uh, as if it were just a naked piece of RNA, it would be instantly destroyed by enzymes inside of the cell cytoplasm. They would eat it, they would destroy it, they would break it into a billion little pieces, it would be totally useless for making proteins. You would not be able to do that. So this mRNA cap is added to one side that prevents the DNA nucleases and RNA nucleases from being able to destroy this part of the uh, protein. They can't get this big giant cap in, in their mouth. They can't break it apart. The tail over here does the same thing. It just gives them something to munch on. This is a bunch of A's that trickle out all the way into here. It's like a five mile long bunch of A's essentially. Um, so the enzymes will start eating the A's over on the end and munching up the A's and munching up the A's. The longer the A's that you produce, the more protein that will be produced. The less A's that are added, the shorter the amount of protein that will be produced. And that's how cells regulate how much protein they want to make. Um, they add a bunch of A's if they want to make a bunch of that particular protein or just a few A's if they don't want to have a bunch of that protein. So essentially the uh, enzymes will eat all the A's, eat all the A's, eat all the A's, and eventually they run out of A's and start eating up the protein. The more A's you have, the longer this process takes, the more proteins you can make. The less A's you have, the shorter they eat it up, the less proteins you can make. And that's how that works. So once you've added the mRNA cap, you added the tail, you get rid of the, in the exons, or introns, excuse me, you don't need those, the useless piece of DNAs, the exons are left behind, spliced back together. You have a mature piece of mRNA, which can now leave the cell's nucleus, enter out into the cytoplasm, and then be used for translation to make a protein. Okay. So these are called codons. Um, this is how the DNA, the mRNA strand, excuse me, is read um, from RNA into uh, proteins, into amino acid uh, language. Um, so check out these supplemental videos on this one. It'll be a little more clear on that one, um, watching this occur in real time. So this is how uh, tRNA works to bring in proteins. I'm going to rely a little bit on the video for this one as well. Um, okay. These are called operons. We're going to rely on the video on these as well. I've got some videos for you guys to so check on these, the supplemental videos. And I'm going to come back in here on mutations. So mutations are going to be changes in cellular DNA. Um, changes that result in proteins um, being incorrectly formed um, or incorrectly functional, um, which result in strange things to occur on the organisms that that happens in. So you can see here, this particular fly had a mutation um, that uh, made him develop legs instead of antenna where he was supposed to. Um, so he's got legs growing out of his forehead instead of antennas. So mutations do very interesting things. So let's talk about the different types of mutations, how they can occur. I mean, where they can occur at. So this is going to be our uh, codons here. So DNA is read in little three-letter segments. Um, so uh, little three uh, letters here, one, two, three, the one big red fly kind of thing. Um, so a point mutation is going to occur when 
one single one of these nucleotides is going to change. Um, I'm going to upload another video on this, guys, giving you guys a little more supplemental information on this one as well. So sometimes bacteria have mutations that occur inside of their cells. So this, this lecture is going to address is how bacteria change their DNA, how changes occur inside of bacteria to allow them to uh, either become more infectious, less infectious, transmit from species to species, um, or things like that, how they change their DNA. So the easiest way for uh, bacteria DNA to change, as well as pretty much every other species on the planet, is through mutation. Um, mutations um, just randomly occur in nature. Um, those are called spontaneous mutations. Um, but sometimes we want to make mutations occur in a lab. Um, and those are called induced mutations. So we'll talk about those a little bit more in a second. Um, so mutations in humans, we have hundreds of thousands of billions of cells. So if one cell has a mutation in it on the inside of my arm muscle, you'll never, ever, ever know it. You won't see it. It probably won't impact my survivability or my functionality at all. I mean, I'll never know. Um, but a bacteria is a single-celled organism. It's prokaryotic. Um, so if it has a mutation inside of its cell, that's going to really impact its survival. It only has one cell. So if its single cell is mutated, whatever is uh, the problem is going to be significantly more visible um, in bacteria, uh, prokaryotic organisms, than in eukaryotes, things that have much more complicated or multicellular organisms. Um, so bacteria are really good ways to study mutations. They div uh, divide very quickly. Um, it's easy to see the mutations, and they're pretty cheap to deal with. Um, and you don't really need a zoo, um, whereas you would say if you studied them in monkeys or something like that, or mice. Um, you can just study them on a petri dish. So these are different types of mutations um, that can be found in nature. Um, these are spontaneous mutations, just so ones that randomly occur when the uh, DNA has a problem. So if you uh, want to review the uh, lectures from earlier, the little uh, videos that I'll post about how DNA is read, codons and things like that, proteins are read using three-letter sections of DNA um, called codons. So if there's an, an error inside of the codon, um, the protein that is produced um, using that codon, it, it can be incorrect. So in this representation, in word form, you have each single letter represents an individual DNA nucleotide. Um, and each individual uh, three-letter word here um, represents an amino acid that's being produced, or the codon itself. So we have a normal functioning DNA gene, and it reads, the man saw the dog hit the can. Um, three letter words, perfect. Um, if this DNA is turned into RNA and then make a protein, the protein that's produced will be exactly the way that it's supposed to. Um, it works the way it's supposed to, it functions the way it uh, should, um, and this bacteria is happy with that functioning protein. Now there's one type of mutation called silent that's not on there. And a silent mutation would essentially be like watching uh, or changing the word can here, the letter C, to a K. The man saw the dog hit the can. K with, can with a K. It's pronounced the same. It reads the same. For all intents and purposes, that is the same word. A silent mutation does not change the message. It doesn't change the protein that's produced. It doesn't change the mRNA message. It doesn't really matter. Now, mutations that change the proteins that are produced, or the amino acids that are in, um, in, in, uh, in the protein, change, protein change, chain, they matter. Those are the ones that uh, can lead to significant problems. So the first one is something called a point mutation. The man saw the dog hit the can. Now in this case, the uh, nucleotide G um, has been swapped accidentally um, for a different nucleotide inside of the DNA chain. Now this changes the message completely. The man saw the dot hit the can. Um, when this occurs, the amino acid is changed. Um, the protein that will be uh, the mRNA message, in, uh, in turn, is also altered, um, which can usually result in a different protein um, being formed, or a different uh, the protein doesn't form correctly. A different amino acid is inserted, um, and the protein does not form correctly and probably won't function correctly. A deletion mutation occurs when an entire amino acid or a codon is accidentally um, removed from the DNA chain. The man saw the hit the can. The dog has been removed. Um, an entire nucleotide has been removed, which in this case will um, result in an amino acid being skipped in the protein uh, protein chain, which will then result in probably not so functional of a protein. 
you can have an insertion type of mutation. And this occurs when a brand new amino acid is accidentally stuck inside of the uh, DNA um, or the mRNA chain. You have a brand new three nucleotides that are added inside of the original DNA, which results in a brand new piece of mRNA being produced um, with an extra piece of uh, uh, amino acid information in it and then extra amino acids added to the protein, which in turn adds to the um, functionality of the protein or it may cause it to not function at all. Um, so in, it's an insertion mutation. And then a frame shift mutation occurs when one single nucleotide is accidentally deleted. Um, so it's not a deletion because a deletion occurs when the entire amino acid is re uh, removed. This occurs when one amino acid, or excuse me, one nucleotide, one letter, is accidentally deleted. Now, if you recall, DNA has to be read in letters of three. It's called codons. It has no choice. So in this case, we got rid of the D. And when that occurred, the dog just turned into the og, it, and ek, and und. <laughs> um, it kind of looks a little bit like German. Um, but what happened was the D was removed. You were forced to still read in letters of three. You just have to do with the next three that show up in line. Um, the D's gone. You don't have a D anymore. So you go with the O-G-H, I-T-T, H-E-C. And that's just what you're stuck with. So when this occurs, obviously the protein that's going to be produced in this is going to be severely malformed. Um, and not at all what we were looking for uh, for the bacteria or the organism to function. So this is the different types of mutations. Um, these are spontaneous mutations. These things occur um, all the time um, throughout nature, just randomly. And then we'll talk about some of the ways that they occur in just a second. So um, sometimes you can uh, uh, have bacteria mutations. Sorry, I should probably go back. Uh, spontaneous mutations just occur because DNA makes errors. Um, it can have an error when it replicates. Um, you could have a, a, a mistake a mistake in the protein that replicates the DNA. Anything um, can result in this happening. They're fairly rare. Um, spontaneous mutations do not occur very often. Um, it would be bad for your DNA to have problems in it. It would mess up your ability to survive. It would mess up your ability to reproduce. Uh, mutations, spontaneous mutations, are extremely rare, 1 in 10 to the 9th. So let's go ahead and talk about how um, bacterial viruses reproduce. It's slightly different. Um, the concept is kind of the same, um, but these guys don't have that concept of uncoding. They don't have an envelope um, that's not going to be in, um, in, uh, brought inside the cell. They don't have to bring inside the capsid. Um, they're going to inject their DNA into the cell. Um, so that's kind of a different step here. Pretty similar, but a little different. Um, now, when these guys um, impact cells, they can re uh, get out of a cell by two different ways, something called the lytic cycle or something called the lysogenic cycle. And we'll talk about this in a, in a second. This is a very interesting concept. Now, this is the stage of bacterial virus reproduction. Reproduction in bacterials, uh, bacteriophages, so steps in phage reproduction. So the very first one is adsorption. So over here, um, adsorption, once again, you've got to get the DNA inside of the cell. I don't have it yet, ready? So here's how this works. Um, so the little uh, bacteriophage is the capsid up here in the top, and then the little lunar lander legs down here at the bottom. So if you've ever used a lancet in class, or you've maybe used one at the doctor's office, it's a little single-use needle. It's got a little spring that's inside of it with a little needle in the middle. Um, and you push the little button on the top, and the little needle fires through the little spring set off. It fires the needle down through the uh, bottom of the lancet into your finger, um, which pricks your finger, and that's how they take your blood at the doctor's office. This is a lancet. It's essentially how this works. So um, a bacteriophage is a capsid on top of a lancet. And that's how that works, or a hypodermic needle, if you like. Um, so the little lunar lander legs, they sit up and um, rigid. And then when the little bacteriophage virus uh, lands on the side of the bacterial cell wall, it lands um, where it needs to go. You can see down here, this is an E. coli cell that's been infected with tons of little uh, bacteriophages. They're all over it. Um, the little lunar lander legs, once they um, go rigid, they're pushed up into place, it triggers the little uh, lancet to be fired. So the spring is depressed. Um, once the spring is depressed, it fires the needle, which you guys can see down here, um, that's through the cell wall of the bacteria. Once the little needle is penetrated through the cell wall of the bacteria, um, the viral head then compresses, 
which squeezes the DNA or RNA of the virus into the cell wall of the bacteria, through the cell wall into the cytoplasm of the bacteria. So now this little capsid, um, this little uh, bacterial cell, uh, bacteriophage capsid is useless. This is no longer uh, important anymore. It will just uh, stay either stuck to the cell wall of the bacteria, just let go, and then float back off into the environment. So once the cytoplasm is, uh, once the uh, DNA is released into the cytoplasm, this is where we'll go ahead and take over here. So one, you've, um, you've absorbed the cell, you've stuck to it. Um, you've now, uh, step two is you've penetrated the bacterial cell. So this is one of the key differences here between bacterial cell replication and uh, virals and, and animal cell replication. Is the uh, host cell of the virus's DNA, um, the DNA of the bacteria is going to be destroyed. Um, doesn't always happen in host cells for animals, not all the time, but sometimes not always. Um, but in bacterial cells, you're going to destroy the DNA here. So the virus DNA is going to be injected. Um, I just went over how that process works, like a, a hypodermic needle. So the viral DNA will be injected inside of the bacteria. Um, the little bacteriophage is also going to contain some enzymes, which will destroy the bacterial DNA. So what's going to happen um, is the bacterial DNA will be destroyed. It will be gotten rid of. Um, and the um, bacterial uh, machinery, the cellular machinery um, inside of it will also start making new copies of the bacterial phage, um, new copies of the bacteria of the virus DNA, new copies of the uh, viral capsid, new copies of the viral enzymes, um, and things like that. So you can see the little viral DNA copies here, the little capsid copies and pieces and things there. Um, so the DNA is not gotten rid of yet, uh, but now the DNA is gone. So what's going to happen um, is now the little virions are going to be put together. Um, you're going to start to assemble all the little pieces of the virus. They're going to have the capsids put together. The little lunar lander legs are going to be assembled. Um, you can see how here how this works. So the capsids put together, the DNA is put together on the inside of the capsid. All the little tail fibers are added, the sheath and all that stuff. All the little pieces of the baby uh, bacteriophage are put together. So once that's uh, done, um, you go through step five, maturation, where the uh, bacteriophages are fully assembled and completely uh, ready to go. Um, and then what's going to happen is the cell is going to be lysed. This is the concept of the water balloon. Um, if you're an enveloped virus in humans, uh, in animal cells, you don't do this process. You bud out. But if you're a non-enveloped virus, you don't have an envelope, you don't need to get a bud, you're just going to lyse the cell. So all bacteriophages will do this at some point in time. This is the... Um, just bacteriophages that we're talking about right here. So these guys will uh, kind of overfill the cell, um, the water balloon concept, too much water in the water balloon, the water balloon pops, the cell will pop, the bacteria cell will pop and die, um, and the little bacteriophages will be released it back into the environment, um, and they'll go infect a new cell. Start the process all over again. So this is the concept of the lytic cycle. Now every once in a while, bacteriophages, different species, can enter something called the lysogenic cycle. Now this occurs when a virus, a bacteriophage, infects a, a bacterial cell, but for whatever reason, it doesn't instantly start into the duplication stage. Um, it doesn't kill the host cell instantly. What it does is it will embed itself inside of the host DNA. So the viral DNA, you guys can see it here, becomes permanently embedded inside of the DNA of the original bacteria. Now when this occurs, um, the bacteria does not become infected with the virus. The virus is not actively uh, making copies of itself. It's not causing problems yet. But now when this DNA replicates, this host cell replicates, it's going to make a copy of its own DNA as well as a copy of that viral DNA. So when this host cell DNA uh, host replicates, you're going to end up with two host cells which have a, co a copy of the virus inside of them. Those two replicate into four, which gives four uh, virally uh, infected cells. Four to eight, eight to 16, 16 to 32. And then all of a sudden you have five million cells which all have copies of the little viral DNA inside of them. And then what can happen is the virus can reactivate and switch from this stage right to here. It's already inside the cell. It's already gotten here. It can go instantly from here to here. It can turn off its lysogenic state, its dormant state, and switch instantly to the duplication state. So it can turn on at any time. Um, so it can be sleeping inside of the colonies of bacteria, chilling out, and then switch on and turn itself on at any time. 
and enter the lytic cycle. So some species of bacteriophages can do it, but not all of them. The virioids. Um, virioids are infectious pieces of DNA that lack a protein coat. Sorry, RNA, not DNA. Little infectious pieces of RNA um, that are found mostly in plants. These are very interesting little um, um, type of uh, infectious particle. Um, what they do is they cause the uh, plant cells to uh, lose the ability to produce very important uh, proteins and very important hormones for the plants to be able to grow. Now you can see here this particular plant has been impacted by a virioid, whereas this one hasn't. Same age plants, same uh, nutrients, just one of them has been severely stunted in its growth. You can see here, same with the fruits. Um, this one's significantly been impacted in its color by a virus. Um, and this type of plant has also once again been impacted by its growth just by having a virus inside of it. Now another type of little infectious agent that's not considered living in a cellular agent is called a prion. Now prions are essentially uh, misfolded proteins. Um, it's a protein that for whatever reason is set up like it's supposed to be in its normal shape, like it's supposed to be fully functioning, doing its thing. Um, but then for whatever reason it breaks. It loses its normal structure. It becomes twisted, warped in an odd way, um, and then it becomes infectious. Um, that infectious protein will then travel, quit doing what it's supposed to do. If it's uh, supporting brain tissue or um, you know, aiding in uh, uh, you know, supporting uh, neurons and things like that, it'll quit whatever it's doing, uh, move on to the next protein nearest it, um, and then make that uh, protein change its shape. Um, and then become an infectious prion as well. So one prion can make two prions, two prions make four, um, and then they self-propagate and make more prions from the rest of the, from the original one. Now we don't know where these come from, we don't know what causes them, they can randomly occur. Um, you literally, you can wake up with a prion one day in your brain, they're extremely rare. We do know that they, how, uh, however, are infectious. Um, they are found in mostly in animal species. I think they're only found in animal species. Um, and they're found uh, proteins that infect, uh, that are found in the brain tissue and nervous tissue of animals. Um, so if you eat brain tissue or nervous tissue of an infected animal um, or an infected human, um, you can potentially get those prions inside of your body. Um, these prions can um, survive, quote unquote, survive. They're not alive. They just don't become denatured, the process of cooking. Um, so they're not broken down, they're not destroyed, um, so you can cook the meat properly uh, and they can still cause infection sometimes. It's a very interesting little uh, type of infectious protein. Um, so one of the very common ones you guys may be familiar with is mad cow disease. Um, it originated in uh, bovine cows, um, actually, uh, or originated probably in sheep. Um, it's a disease called scrapies and got it from cows. Um, and what happened is, uh, cows got it from uh, it's a sheep anyway. And what happens is uh, you would, a long time ago in Europe in the 80s, not a long time ago, in the 80s, 1980s, 1990s, um, they would feed cows um, protein and uh, derived from uh, other animals. Um, so instead of protein derived from uh, beans and soybeans and stuff like that in their diet, the protein that the cows would be fed at the feedlots were derived from uh, uh, meat of other cows, uh, leftover meat scraps and things like that from the uh, slaughterhouses. Uh, so what uh, happened um, is they somehow got a piece of contaminated meat um, from the slaughterhouses um, from an organism that had an infectious prion, um, got some of the brain tissue or the nervous tissue of that organism inside of the food supply. Now once that occurred, um, that protein was then fed to other cows um, who got that infected tissue, that infected brain tissue in their diet. And they were then became infected with prions. They uh, then in turn got mad cow disease. Those cows were slaughtered, um, and then the process was repeated over and over again. Now, if humans eat that steak uh, or anything uh, from that cow, we could potentially um, get that prion from them as well. Um, those prions do the same thing in us as they do in the cow. They take over our, uh, our other our proteins and cause them to quit doing what they're supposed to do. And now in uh, cows, it's called mad cow disease or bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Spongiform, uh, it's the name, uh, spongiform, the, their brain looks like a sponge and has lots of holes inside of it uh, from the proteins quitting do, uh, doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and in humans, it's called Kurtzfeld-Yakov's disease. Now, vaccines. 
Um, to note, to date, there have been no drugs that have ever been developed that can outright just cure a viral infection. We can prevent them in the sense of uh, you can uh, train the body to fight against the virus from the get-go. You can block the uh, receptor sites, like I mentioned earlier, or you can destroy the virus when it's outside of the human cells. But once the virus is inside of the human cell, there's very little you can do about it. Because if you want to destroy the human cell, or if you want to destroy the virus, you have to destroy the host cell that it's inside, unfortunately. And to do that means that you cause damage to the host. And that's kind of the opposite of what treatment is supposed to do. Uh, but vaccines um, are one of the ways that humans have developed to uh, prevent um, um, viruses in the first place. Now, viruses and uh, vaccines, vaccines get their name um, from the very first type of vaccine, quote unquote, that was developed. A guy named Edward Jenner um, developed a vaccine um, for smallpox in the 17, uh, late, 18, uh, late 17, early 1800s. Um, he derived it using a virus called uh, cowpox. Um, cowpox, uh, vaccin is the Latin word for cow. Um, vaccine, vaccin, that's where the name vaccines come from. Um, now, um, a couple of the issues surrounding vaccines are that vaccines contain mercury. They do contain mercury, um, but mercury comes in multiple different forms. You have elemental mercury and ethyl mercury. Elemental mercury is extremely dangerous. Ethyl mercury, your body can turn it into alcohol and you urinate it out. It's completely harmless. Ethyl mercury is found in vaccines and in um, not elemental mercury. Scientists aren't that dumb. Um, Ethyl mercury is found in vaccines that contain something called thermosil. Um, it's a preservative that's found in multi-use vaccines. Um, so if the doctor grabs the bottle off the shelf, puts the syringe on it, turns it upside down, and sucks it out, puts the bottle back up on the shelf, it contains thermosil. It allows it to be stable at room temperature. Um, if you are concerned about mercury for any reason whatsoever, or if you have patients that are concerned about mercury, there's no reason to be. Um, but they do make single-use vaccines. Um, versions of them that don't contain thermosil um, if you have a patient that is concerned about that. You could also inform them that there's more elemental mercury because of the practices of our uh, dumping our um, um, electronics in the ocean. There's more elemental mercury um, in a single can of Starkist tuna than there is in the an entire route of childhood vaccines. A um, couple of other things about vaccines is they cause autism. Um, that theory was, or not theory, that um, silly idea was brought about in the 1990s by a guy in England um, who was um, going to try to form a link between the MMR vaccine, children that had been vaccinated with the MMR, um, and those that had um, autism. Now, how he did this is he did a 2,000-child study on 2,000 children, looking at those that had been vaccinated and those that hadn't. Um, and then what he did was he looked at those that grew up and had autism and those that didn't. And then when he ran the results, he came to find out that it was something like a 20% increase um, in those that had been vaccinated um, with those that developed autism and those that hadn't. So his conclusion was that vaccines cause, or the MMR vaccine, um, leads to a 20% increase in the likelihood of a, a child developing autism. Now... Come to find out, um, people around the world, other scientists, started looking at this guy's study and went, hmm, that seems kind of fishy. Can we see your results? Can we see your study, please? And he wouldn't give it to them. It seems kind of odd that if you uh, believe in your study, you wouldn't let people see your study. Uh, it ended up in court. Um, he was sued. Um, he had to release his uh, medical study, his entire study. And come to find out, his 2,000-child study um, was conducted on about 20 children at his 5-year-old child's birthday party without the consent of the kids. Um, so he faked his entire study. All of it was done on 20 kids. He faked the results. Um, he didn't get uh, consent from their parents. Um, he fudged the whole thing, made it all up. And his entire study was also funded by an anti-vaccine pro, uh, 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 anti-vaccine um, uh, uh, vaccines cause autism group um, that had paid for his entire study. So he faked the whole thing. Um, turns out that the uh, uh, British courts re uh, revoked his medical license. He was thrown in jail. Um, but that didn't make headlines. Um, that type of sensational news doesn't make headlines as much as vaccines cause autism. So there's more to that story that people tend to not know. Um, it's just the vaccines cause autism part of that tended to stick around. So vaccines um, have done tons of useful things for humanity over time. Um, whereas the uh, lack of vaccines led to thousands of people dying from very, very, very preventable uh, illnesses. So how do vaccines work? 
It's essentially like um, training to fight Mike Tyson. You can either go out and fight Mike Tyson with absolutely no training whatsoever, and he's probably going to kill you. Or you can take one of two different forms of vaccines. There's something called a weakened or an attenuated form of a vaccine. That's the same word, weakened or attenuated, or kill. Now, essentially what they do here is they take the virus itself or a bacteria, whatever it is, um, and they're going to kind of uh, weaken it a little bit, take some of its infectious ability out. So take the virus and knock off about 80% of its ability to cause disease. So this is essentially Mike Tyson, and they're going to take Mike Tyson and tie one of his arms and one of his legs behind his back. So he's not going to be able to fight as well as he could, um, really. So you might have a chance against him now. If we injected full-on HIV or full-on flu into the human body, you'd get really sick and you might die. We don't want to do that. But if we inject, like, 10% flu into your body, your immune system's going to be able to go, oh, I got this. Um, and it's going to be able to come up, and it's going to be able to knock out Mike Tyson, figure out how to fight Mike Tyson, and beat him up, and uh, be prepared if Mike Tyson ever shows up. So, you're either going to have a weak form of Mike Tyson with his arms tied behind his back, or somebody's going to just kill Mike Tyson and show you what he looks like. Um, and if you ever see him again, you'll know what to look for. Um, and that's how that works. So, um, you're going to form antibodies, and this is essentially what your body's going to use to remember what Mike Tyson's looks like. So these are the soldiers that fight against Mike Tyson. So you fight against a weak Mike Tyson, your body forms tons of soldiers. Your body's shown a dead Mike Tyson, it goes, oh, I still need to know what Mike Tyson looks like in case he shows up again, and you form tons of antibodies for that as well. And then what happens is those antibodies have no, nothing to do, there's no virus floating around, they just spend their time chilling in your body. And then what happens if the, you come in contact with that virus in nature again, Mike Tyson shows up at your front doorstep, you've got tons of soldiers ready to fight against him. So if he ever shows up, they're ready to go, they can kick his butt. They kill the little weak version of Mike Tyson, train themselves, get ready to go. This is training, getting ready to figure out how to go. And then if real Mike Tyson ever knocks at the door, your body is ready to go. It's already got the soldiers trained that know what to do that can kill him before there's any problems at all. And that's how vaccines work. Um, you make vaccines in a lab by growing them inside of cells. So you have to grow the virus um, up inside of a lab to get the DNA, to get the particles and stuff out of the virus that you need to make the vaccine. So what's going to happen is you have to have living cells to, uh, for viruses to reproduce. We talked about that earlier. They cannot reproduce by themselves. So you're going to have a big giant vat of... Um, yeast cells or human cells or uh, animal cells, depending on what the virus reproduces in. And you're going to introduce the virus to that. That virus is going to reproduce inside of all of those cells. Um, propagate, propagate, propagate. And you're going to grow up a ton of that virus inside of the cell. Then what's going to happen is you're going to purify away all of the virus particles away from all the cell junk. Um, once you've got the virus particles away, you're going to kill them. And this is where you weaken Mike Tyson. You turn Mike Tyson into Mike and Tyson. <laughs> and then the Mike part can be injected, and the Tyson part's gotten rid of, and the Mike part is in, um, fixed with other chemicals, stabilizers, and things like that. Um, things that make it safe to be injected in the body, things that make it safe to, uh, to put on the shelf for a little while so it doesn't break down, and things like that. Um, and then your body knows what Ty Mike looks like, um, so if Mike Tyson ever shows up, it already knows how to fight the Mike part. Um, it's pretty good. She's going to figure out how to fight the Tyson part pretty quickly. Um, and your body's going to be uh, trained from this little shot to fight Mike Tyson um, through this process.